Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome to Beyond the Matrix with Rod Bryant and Jerry Gordon here on Israel News Talk Radio. Unplug, strap yourself in because you are about to move beyond the Matrix. And you are officially at Beyond the Matrix here on Israel News Talk Radio. Thank you guys for joining us. Really appreciate it that you listen in. Thank you for the comments that you send to the station on a regular basis. Uh, Some very good input as well. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe right here. Subscribe button is right there. And uh, hit follow for notification so that when we do a new show, you'll be notified of it. Jerry, we have a a guest we've had on, on a regular basis. He's one of our probably finest analyst that we bring on. He's very trained in this area. It's Stephen Bryan. Give just a little tidbit of, of bio on, on Stephen. Well, <clears throat> Steve is a former Pentagon official during the Reagan era. He was the Deputy Undersecretary for Security and Technology. He was also president of Finn Mechanica, which was the U.S. subsidiary of the Italian defense company. Uh, but he's probably the most astute military technologist in uh, the swamp of Washington, D.C., to be quite honest about it. Uh, He thinks geopolitically about what is feasible and not. And in this case, he really came up with something novel. Novel in one sense in that it was a way by which the Taiwanese, besieged by threats of an invasion by China, could have access to U.S. F-35Bs. That's the vertical takeoff and landing version. And Steve talks about this in the context of almost the analogy with the U.S. during 1940, supplying Britain at its lowest point with 58 overage destroyers on what was called Lend-Lease. Right. And that is you know, some of the historical background behind it, but it's a testimony to the lack of military relations between the U.S. and Taiwan when Kissinger and Nixon threw over Taiwan essentially to get close to China. Yes, in the in the modern vernacular, they threw Taiwan under the bus. the bus. And we are slowly starting to reestablish some of those connections and relationships. And uh, God willing, uh, we're going to be able to talk about this on the show and get some really good information. We're also going to be talking about Azerbaijan and Israel's relationship. So, guys, don't go away. We're going to be right back after this break. You're listening to Beyond the Matrix here on Israel News Talk Radio. Israel is located in one of the most volatile areas in the world. Israel is an island of stability and a sea of war and unrest. In the midst of this turmoil, Israel stands out as a beacon of order and human progress. Each week we update you on what's happening in this, the Jewish state, a true light unto the nations. This is Jay Shapiro. Join me every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to Beyond the Matrix, here on Israel News Talk Radio. I'm Rod Bryant, along with Jerry Gordon, and uh, he is an amazing sidekick, still recovering from the hurricane. Can't, uh, can't wait till you get to full back, full back function. It'd be great. And then, of course, we have our illustrious guest, Stephen Bryan, who has always uh, brought about some great uh, analytical uh, information on the Mideast as well as in Asia. And uh, so we're going to have an interesting discussion today. Uh, Jerry, why don't you go ahead and start off with the first question? Steve, you uh, caused a flurry of interest with a Newsweek article about Taiwan leasing F-35s from the U.S. to deal with a rising Chinese threat. Why don't you tell us what the deal is and uh, why it has captured uh, some very interesting attention both in Taiwan and obviously in Beijing. <laughs> well, it, it should have. It was, that was the whole point was to try and stimulate the conversation because up to now, the U.S. has not agreed to sell F-35s to Taiwan. This is, of course, the stealth fighter. Um, the, my objective was twofold. I mean, one is that Taiwan is in a bit of trouble right now. 
because China is building up its forces, threatening. They just carried out a, a big invasion military exercise to show they could send the thousands of troops into Taiwan and take it over or whatever they're going to do with it. Um, so, and, and despite the fact that Taiwan has quite a bit of military equipment, it doesn't have anything at the level of the F-35. Now, I'm talking about a specific kind of F-35. You know, there are three variants. The standard one, uh, what they call the B model, which is a short takeoff and landing, and the C model, which is a carrier model for use on air, aircraft carriers. The B model is what Taiwan needs. Why do they need it? Because Taiwan's airfields are under direct assault from Chinese missiles. And the expectation is from most of the scenarios and most of the simulations, war games that have been looked at, is that the Chinese will try to destroy all the airfields initially in the start of any fight to take over or to invade Taiwan. The F-35B can take off from your backyard. It doesn't require an air base. It can, you can put it on a highway or a parking lot with lots of you know support equipment, of course, but you can make it very difficult for the Chinese A to find them and B to knock them out before they can get in the air. And if they can get in the air, the Chinese are in trouble because it's a far superior airplane to anything that the, the Chinese have. So uh, that, that the idea is to give them or get them that airplane somehow. Now, if the U.S. decided tomorrow morning to put them on Taiwan, the Chinese would go nuts. We know that. I mean, we've been there, done that. There would be a big mess. And I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think that we could keep them in the U.S., train the pilots here, and have them on emergency standby. It only takes some hours to get them to Taiwan. They can be refueled in flight. They, they can get there in, you know, in, overnight. So the, any dreams that the Chinese have about knocking off Taiwan have to take into account maybe 100 F-35Bs showing up. Okay. And that also relieves the U.S. of having to intervene directly early. You know, we have F-35s in Japan. And we have, we have the possibility of using them from Okinawa, which is fairly close. Um, and, and so we could deploy them. And that, by the way, those are Bs. So, that, so the, we could deploy them. But that puts us directly in the flight, fight right away. The, the real essence of all this is deterrence. What we want is deterrence. If China thinks it can invade, it will invade, in my opinion. The only thing holding it back right now is they're afraid of President Trump. I think that's the case. What happens if there's another administration? I don't know. I really don't. So I think that, that where we are is that it would be in our interest, in Taiwan's interest, and in the interest of peace and stability to find a way to provide F-35Bs. Now, I propose a lease, you know, keep them in the U.S. with a lease so Taiwan doesn't have to shell out $10 billion tomorrow morning to buy them and wait five years to get them. Uh, but, but a lease, we could even possibly re, uh, retail, we call it changing the tail of the airplane, so that they become U.S. ones, become Taiwanese ones, if we want to do that. We did it. Uh, we have done it before. I mean, we did it with Britain, of course, in World War II, 1940, right. with the, uh, the destroyers and the other naval equipment, and with airplanes. Okay, we provided airplanes. Uh, so, I mean, there was this famous dialogue, with, you know, about how they're going to get them to Canada so they could fly them to Britain, because the, the U.S. Neutrality Act seemed to prevent it. But we figured it out. So uh, the bottom line is that I think that idea has some merit for achieving a number of political objectives, military objectives, and the objective of maintaining stability, peace in the region. That's, that's the thought. Stephen, I, 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 uh, go ahead, uh, Jerry. I, uh, let me just ask this one question. It, it, it sort of dovetails into this, this idea that China obviously uh, can, has the equipment to uh, do some damage to Taiwan. Uh, the recent border incursion that took place uh, and India basically trumped them, pushed them out with a few special operation guys that were there. 
Uh, does is that any indication as to China's abilities at all? No, okay. I don't. Think so you don't think so? I, mean, I, I don't know enough about that operation to say much, but I think that the Indians were caught with their pants down. So, uh, oh, they they were, but they totally repelled the whole whole attack or did. the whole incursion. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of stories about that that still need to be sorted out. One of them is that the Chinese troops were very reluctant to go there in the first place. Right, right. That's a very interesting thing. Yeah, maybe because, maybe we can pull that up and chat about it one day because I've, I've done a, a, some research on the organization that they have trained since, I, I think they started back during the Vietnam War when, special, uh, when Green Berets were coming out. And it's a special group of Indian, or actually they're Tibetan fighters. And right. so it, it'd be an interesting discussion, but I just didn't know, well, does this... Does this indicate that China maybe doesn't have that? Maybe don't have the ability to do well, what they need. No to do. one really knows anything about China's modern fighting ability. The last time we saw Chinese troops was in 1950, right? That's the last time it was in Korea, where they used human wave attacks. So right, <laughs> it, wasn't, right. it wasn't the sort of modern warfare. No, uh, and it was devastating. I mean, they they achieved a lot actually. Pushed us back. Right. Could you imagine how uh, terrifying that would be? <laughs> Goodness gracious. Yeah, because they didn't care about the casualties. Uh, you know, they were willing to take huge casualties in exchange for holding territory. That was the bottom the bottom line. Um, and, and the kind of uh, warfare then was mainly artillery and, you know, very some armor, but mostly artillery and troops running across uh, different areas and trying to attack the other right, troops. Right, right. Um, Today, it's a little different. I mean, China has modern weapons. It has a fairly decent-looking air force, on paper at least, decent. Uh, the airplanes they have, the J-10, the J-11, the, F the Su-35, and the J-20, which is not ready yet, but it's, it, I mean, it's being flown around and tested, but it's not. The production models aren't there yet. They're just starting to come online. That's their stealth aircraft, or they claim to be stealth. Um, and we'll see. I'm not sure. Uh, they've tried to copy our, our F-22, actually. Yeah. But in any case, uh, no one knows how well they can fight. Yeah, I guess that's the big indicator. You can have all the best equipment or, quote, you know, look like very good modern equipment, but it still it depends on the, the will of the fighter and the abilities of the fighter. So, uh, That's right. Jerry, go ahead. Steve, uh, during the prelude break, we were talking about the rather complicated relations between the U.S. and Taiwan, hearkening back to Mr. Kissinger and President Nixon, who basically threw over Taiwan for essentially capturing uh, relations with China. That's right. You have about two minutes. What, ha what happened after that? Well, what happened was that we didn't do much for Taiwan. I mean, you know, we were sort of out of Taiwan. We took our troops out of Taiwan. Our military bases were taken out of Taiwan. We de-recognized Taiwan. We cut off any contacts between the mil two militaries, so the Taiwanese military couldn't talk to the American, couldn't co coordinate with the American military. Essentially, we abandoned them. Uh, it was only because Congress in 79 passed the Taiwan Relations Act that some redress of the balance took place, but not a lot. And, and all the administrations, Republican and Democrat, until the recent one, which is different, until the recent one, have been very hesitant to commit very much to Taiwan for lots of reasons. I was in Taiwan in 96 when the, when the, when the Chinese tried to organize themselves to the missile operation and maybe an invasion. We, no one knew. And it was took weeks to get two U.S. aircraft carriers positioned to let the Chinese know we were not going to permit that. But two weeks, like today, two weeks is dead. You're dead. Yeah, especially when things move at the pace it does now with transportation. Yeah. Two weeks is unacceptable. So that is, that is essentially where we've been. And it's been slow process of trying to turn the – the situation around and to begin to restore relations military to military. You know, Taiwan has doesn't actually have a military mission in the U.S. It has a trade mission. We, we're we're going to have to go to a break, uh, Stephen. But when we come back, I'd like to pick it up right there. Uh, the discussion about Taiwan's abilities um, 
and capabilities would be something interesting to talk about. Uh, we have to go to a break, guys. Don't don't go away. I just want to remind you guys that are watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe right there. Hit the subscribe button and then the notification button, and uh, you'll be able to watch the show or get notification of the show. And then also reminding you that you're listening to Beyond the Matrix here on Israel News Talk Radio. We'll be right back. The Tamar Yona Show. Tamar? She's sassy. She's smart. She's funny. But she's also a real Jewish mother. Hi, everybody. I'm Tamar Yona. And yes, I can be all of those things. But at Israel News Talk Radio, I'm here to bring you the news stories and guests that you may not hear anywhere else. Join me live on air Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays for the most unique and bold talk radio in Israel. The Tamar Yona Show. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Did you know this psalm and many others were composed by a Jewish shepherd and musician who later became a king? Would you like to know some of the inner meanings of psalms to help you connect with God and strengthen your soul? An exciting and easy to read book is now available, which will help you do just that. Software for the Soul, Psalms for Everyone, available on Kindle, Audible, and Amazon.com. Software for the Soul. Welcome back to Beyond the Matrix, here on Israel News Talk Radio. We're with Stephen Bryan. I'm Rod Bryant, along with Jerry Gordon, and we're talking about uh, Taiwan and what's been going on, the proposal that he had made about F-35s being leased, and I'm sure there are people mumbling under their breath thinking, we can't afford to do this, but we also have F-35s in many different countries already, correct? Uh, in in the break, we I would mentioned something about, you know, hey, is it, you know, are we attempting or trying to provoke China as we as the United States have been accused of by other countries including China or are we just protecting our interest what's the word I think we're protecting our interests very much so uh, if we do this in fact supporting Taiwan is protecting our interests it's a dem- democratic country a very vigorous democratic country mm-hmm. it's an economic power in its own right and it's done very well uh, it would be a terrible thing to surrender the people of Taiwan to China's dictatorship. I don't see why we would do that. Does China have a, a, a bone to pick on this deal in the sense that they f- are claiming ownership of Taiwan? What kind of bone? Well, I'm, I'm just saying, are they, what, what are they saying? Say again. Do you mean a legal one? A right. Political yeah, one? political, legal, it doesn't matter. Well, they, they say Taiwan is historically part of China. And there's some grounds for that claim. But the Taiwanese people say the opposite. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, who, wow. who wins this argument? The people or some legal principle that the Chinese are pushing? Chinese don't care about legal principles when it goes against them. So, for example, they took these reefs and islands in the South China Sea, even after the international court said that it didn't belong to China. They just said, they all right. They did it anyway. Yeah, we're going in there and we're taking them. And they did. And nobody stopped them. So, I, you know, China also claims Okinawa. Okay. They they compl- they claim some of the Ryukyu Islands. I mean, so it, where does it start and where does it stop? Right. At, at some point in the modern age, we've just got to draw the lines and that's where it's going to stay. But they, they, they made a thing out of this because it's somehow a test of Chinese manhood to say they've got to take back Taiwan because it's ours. Um, well, we could have said we want to take back Canada because it's ours. <laughs> not doing it. Um, you know, I think it's enough already. Uh, the Chinese are, are essentially their own worst enemy on this. But they also want to try and, you know, wear people down. There is a faction in Taiwan. Uh, I, I have to be clear. There's a faction in Taiwan, particularly in, in the old Guomintang party, that supports some kind of uh, amalgamation with China. What kind is a very complex issue? Because since the Hong Kong mess, uh, even Guomintang in in Taiwan has changed its tune and is less enthusiastic about 
having its rights because there's not going to be a single independent politician in Taiwan if it's taken over by China. Oh, of course. It's going to be controlled by the Communist Party, 100%. Right. Oh, a nightmare. Period. Nightmare. Uh, yeah. Jerry, go ahead. Steve, um, Secretary of State Pompeo is uh, about to travel in that region, and there's the discussion of creation of a quad consisting of Australia, India, United States, and Japan. And is that the equivalent of a regional NATO in the context of defending something like uh, Taiwan? Could be. It could be. What about Taiwan? Can't they be a member? Well, Taiwan could be a member. What are they there for? To defend against what? I mean, the most likely scenario of any kind of conflict it would be an attack by China on one of the players and the most likely target is Taiwan. So, I mean, if you leave Taiwan out, you're just perpetuating the same old mess. Yeah, yeah. Secondly, it's very complicated in Japan because, you know, the Japanese are not so sure about how much they want to defend Japan. And they don't like militarism. They don't want... You know, and, and, the, and the Chinese are working that issue very hard in Japan, you know, with propaganda and with influence operations and with trade deals and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So I'm not sure China, Japan, I'm sorry, I'm not sure Japan is in a position to sign up to such a thing. Interesting. That's, it remains to be seen. And then Pompeo also is very keen on trying to get China, uh, Japan to improve its defense capacity significantly because they're you know they they have this self defense force but it's it's not much and it doesn't have much equipment and it doesn't have much you know ambition and it's not it's not very useful the only the, the thing that's most useful in Japan is the air force which i think has got a lot of f35s now is pretty good and their navy is good especially their submarine force is excellent that's their their, their big stuff when you get uh, when you get to the, the army and all that, less less interesting, less capable. So, uh, yeah, I mean, regional a regional uh, agreement among the willing, what used to call the coalition of the willing, would be a big step forward, but there isn't one. And remember, uh, Japan doesn't always get along with all its neighbors aside from China. For example, Korea, where the relations between Japan and Korea are pretty bad. So... So it's it's a it's a tricky uh, thing. I don't think that you know, I think Pompeo will settle for improving Japan's defense capabilities, and Australia doesn't need to. I mean, Australia is a very serious country that cares about its independence, and it's a very strong country. So, what then uh, credence do you give to these uh, programs called uh, fortress? Taiwan on the part of uh, the Rand Corporation and others in what you just discussed. If we're thinking about Taiwan defending itself against China, it cannot. Okay. I mean, you're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not like the Arabs in Israel be where the Arabs were incompetent and the Israelis were competent. Okay. That was one showed the, you know, the uh, David and Goliath book. But the David and Goliath problem in China and Taiwan is a totally different picture. Taiwan, I mean, Taiwan's facing a formidable enemy, a big enemy with lots of weapons. And it's and, and they know how to use them, or at least we think they know how to use them. So Fortress Taiwan by itself is not going to do it. What we really need is a defense treaty with Taiwan, to be blunt about it. Yeah. Uh, we don't have one. We don't have any agreement with Taiwan at all, other than the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, which uh, doesn't really provide for any commitment by the U.S. to defend to Taiwan. It's, we're supposed to help give them military supplies to keep them competitive, so to speak. But but there's nothing there that commits us to defend them. That would make be a major statement if uh, if the U.S. would broker that. I don't think it's really realistic. You don't think it's going to happen. Um, well, what we've got are these um, 
sideshow recommendations to at least illuminate what the vulnerability is of Taiwan to a possible invasion by China. Yeah, I know we're doing some things. They just they just announced another arms sale this past week to Taiwan. Right. Not all that exciting, but there's some good stuff in it. Um, we're, we're doing some things to give them some tools. But you know, it's it's been a. Let me give you one example just to show you how big a difficulty this thing. I was going to use a different terminology, but it's not nice on YouTube. Um, uh, Taiwan has its own indigenous fighter aircraft called the FCK-1. Uh, it's a pretty good aircraft. But then, of course, most of the parts came from the United States. Okay, some from Europe, but mostly from the U.S. When Taiwan was after an engine for this design, <coughs> we restricted the engine so that the plane wouldn't be able to fly very far. Why? Well, they might attack China. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Taiwan's going to attack China? <laughs> you know, That's funny. It, I, I didn't know this. <laughs> yeah, but they restricted it. So the plane has what we call short legs. <laughs> okay, so it can't go very far. Can't stay in the air very long. It's like a short arm boxer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I mean, this is the kind of nonsense that was going on for years between the U.S. and Taiwan. And, you know, they didn't have good aircraft until finally George Bush in 1991 approved uh, F-16s. But the early model of the F-16, the ABs, now they're trying to upgrade them. They have a program to upgrade, which is very important. Okay, I'm for, all for it. They should be upgraded. And then, then Taiwan's also going to get F-16V, which is a very good airplane. But it's not a stealth aircraft. And again, when we're talking about the balance of forces, there has to be some way for Taiwan to survive an initial assault to give the U.S. time to respond itself. We're that's, not going to respond on day one. I'm yeah, sorry. That, that's that's actually what I would like to, to bring up in the break after the break uh, so we can talk about it. The idea of air defense uh, is, you know, do they have those capabilities? Do they have uh, capability of defending themselves? from air attack or missiles uh, we don't have time to answer right now but when we come back we will so don't hold your breath i would hate for you to pass out in the middle of the program guys if you're watching on youtube thank you very much uh play please take time to share it on social media if you don't watch it on youtube and you listen to it please take time to share it from uh the israel news talk radio website and you can find it at israelnewstalkradio.com we'll be right back after these very amazing messages time where feelings have become fact, where rational thought and common sense has disappeared, one man stands above it all. I'm Howie Sobaker, your political hitman. Local Hitman airs every Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. North American time, 7 a.m. Israeli time, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to Beyond the Matrix, here on Israel News Talk Radio. We are back in the final segment. I'm Rod Bryant, along with Jerry Gordon and Stephen Bryan. We're having a really interesting discussion about Taiwan. And the question I asked, to, asked you, Stephen, before the break was about China's, I mean, uh, Taiwan's capabilities 
of defending herself uh, from missiles, uh, aircraft, or whatever? Well, Taiwan has some air defenses, some pretty good ones, but not enough. They have the, the Patriot Pac-3, which is the most advanced Patriot. Uh, in fact, they just signed a contract to uh, improve some of it and, and re repair some of it. So it's a fairly healthy contract. It's $680 million, wow. a lot of money. Wow. It, the system costs six point let's see, six point five billion. Wow, well, not, cheap, not no, cheap, not cheap at all. Uh, so that's their major one. They also have a, a lots of shoulder filed man pads missiles. They have a system called Tian Kung Two, which is one they developed themselves, which is actually originally based on the Nike Hercules, which is good oh, for wow. high altitude yeah. threat. And uh, and they have Hawk. They still have Hawk's uh, Hawk operating, uh, improved Hawk, which is the U.S. is no longer has them. But right. but they're 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 a good system, yeah. you know, very reliable uh, system. Yeah. So they have some stuff. Right. Uh, but you know, the problem the U.S. has more generally is that is that nowadays the kind of threat comes at all different levels. You know, I, no, I, yeah, I was just going to say with with. Uh, drones you have mm -hmm. guided this you know all this stuff flying at you and you have to sort it out right and get enough uh, of your own missiles in the air to knock them out um patriot's not real good at that right uh, it, that's one of its uh, shortcomings uh, and it's also not good kinetically against uh, some of these uh, heavy threats mm -hmm. um about the other stuff i don't really know enough to tell you but uh, it's a challenge for Taiwan. Well, I tell you, you know, simply China has the capability, we know this for sure, of overwhelmingly sending munitions, weapons, planes, uh, missiles. They can just overwhelm a system, and that would be just as good as anything else out there. Yeah, because they can't knock it out. Right. right. That's the key. If you can find ways where they can't knock it out, then, then you have right. something. I visited the island of Kinmen, also known as Kimoi, a number of times. It's fairly, it's it's about a mile from China. It's, oh, wow. I didn't know. It's Kimoi, and then right across the water there is Greater Amoy, which is China. Um, and Kimoi was shelled heavily in the 1950s, 58, I think it was. Remember the famous debate with Nixon. Uh, Kennedy debate where they were talking about what to do about Kimoy and Matsu. Uh, and Kennedy wanted to defend Kimoy and Matsu. Um, it's pretty hard to defend. But what the what the Taiwanese did on Kimoy, I've never been to Matsu, but I've been to Kimoy, is almost everything's underground in, uh, in bomb shelter. Even, even the city hospital is underground. Okay, so their answer is to be hardened. They're, they hardened the island. That's right. Now, whether it would still work today, you know, how many years ago was that? 58. So you could do right. the math. 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, I'm not sure. But it's very impressive when you see it. I bet. I bet. Jerry, did you want to uh, lead on some, on some questions? Yeah, I did. Uh, turning to the war in the South Caucasus between Azerbaijan and Armenia over the breakaway Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh, who are the players and why is Israel there supplying weapons? Well, because the Armenians, I mean, the Azerbaijanis bought them. Uh, Correct. Uh, that was the main reason. Look, the starting with who's there. Uh, the Russians are on both sides. They've supplied equipment to Azerbaijan, and of course they, they're really sponsors of Armenia, and they supply equipment to Armenia. So the, the fundamental equipment in use, for, for the most part, is, is Russian. But in recent years, Azerbaijan in particular has acquired quite a few systems from Europe and, and from Israel uh, and also even from Belarus. And they have been, you know, both sides, but mostly Armenians are talking to the Chinese, uh, which has made the Russians unhappy. Uh, so, now, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of systems that have come, gone in, but, but I think the big players still are the Russians. 
from a military point of view. All the other stuff is sort of supplemental. Now, the, the Turks have also supplied weapons, especially their their uh, uh, Barakhtar drone, which is a TB2, TB2 drone, which has performed very well. So the Turks have been doing that. And there are allegedly, and it's alleged because everybody denies it, but I think it's true, there's at least two and maybe four uh, Turkish F-16s that are operating in Azerbaijan. Where they are at the moment is anybody's guess, but uh, they were the ones that, one of them apparently is the one that shot down the Sukhoi, the Armenian Sukhoi 25. So and now from Israel's point of view, Azerbaijan is really very important. First of all, Azerbaijan is very friendly to Israel. It's a Muslim country. But the relationship between Israel and Azerbaijan is normal. Secondly, Azerbaijan is a very tolerant country. There is an active and successful, more than one Jewish community in Azerbaijan uh, and have never been interfered with. They, they do, they do uh, both, uh, both Ashkenazi ones and Sephardic ones. So they, they, they had that uh, uh, benefit, let's call it that, for the Jews that live there. And they've lived there for hundreds of years. Uh, the thing that people don't notice is that about as many Azerbaijanis are in Azerbaijan or in Iran. Don't discount the importance of that. It's extraordinarily important to Israel. It's extraordinarily important to the United States. So we talk about 10 or 15 million Azerbaijanis in Iran. I did not know that. So at some level, this is a this is an asset on the ground. Huge asset, especially yeah. nowadays. And it's a lot I mean, of people. You yeah. can imagine what the value is. I'm not going to even tell you what it yeah, is. Yeah, I have to. Don't but, want to don't want to stir up any more trouble. You've already got enough. You don't want to go there. But but I think that the fact is that that's a significant thing. Um, and that influences Israel's posture toward Azerbaijan. By the way, the Israeli courts today or yesterday said there's no basis for stopping arms sales to Azerbaijan. Wow, big move, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because there was a peace group in Israel that, that took that to court, demanding that arms sales to Azerbaijan stop, and they lost. So, Fantastic, the, the yeah. There isn't any proof that they've done anything illegal. You know, they're defending Azerbaijani territory. Nagorno-Karabakh, legally, according to the UN, belongs to Azerbaijan. Um, now, why they'd want it is another story entirely. There's about 150,000 people there. That's it, in that territory. And 85% of them are Armenians. Um, most of the Azerbaijanis have been run out of there. But, you know, they've been unable to reach a settlement of this issue for 20 years, 30 years. And it's really an issue that ought to be settled. I mean, there are there are compensations one can think of that could be put in place. The refugees from uh, Nagorno-Karabakh in, in Azerbaijan need compensation. They lost their homes, their properties, their businesses. Um, there's a territorial issue that needs compensation. Um, there, you know, they've been trying, you know, the, now the Moscow is sponsoring another, I don't want to call it a peace conference because it's not quite that, but it's a, a consultation in, in, in Moscow with the parties to try and restart what's called the Madrid process. The U.S., EU, the Russians are all part of this peace process, the Madrid agreement. Um, it's failed every time it's been tried in the past, mostly because the Armenians have been inflexible. And remember, the Armenian, that this Nagorno-Karabakh has also been declared an independent republic. I don't know if you know that. Called the Republic of Artsakh, Artsakh, A-R-T-S-A-K-H, which has its own leader but it doesn't have its own currency. And it only has a part of it, its own army. The rest of them are Armenian troops with a different hat. Um, 
And, you know, they've been belligerent as well. So to try and find some compromise has been very difficult because of posturing it. But a little bit by both sides, but I think the Armenians have been hardliner. When they got close to an agreement before the Armenians bailed out, said, no, we're not doing it. And it quite upset the Russians because the Russians didn't want that. To, they wanted to settle. The Russians don't need this as a problem. Well, I'm hoping that one day uh, peace becomes such a problem that we don't have to worry about. It would ruin our show. We'd only be able to talk about peace in the world. That would be nice to have. But for now, it does seem, though, with asymmetrical warfare, uh, with terrorism, there is a lot of shifting sand in in all of this. And uh, strength is very important for our country to have, as well as uh, as the United States and and. Uh, uh, what do you call freedom loving countries it's 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 important to have the power guys we're at the end of the show Stephen. i really appreciate it thank you so much you're a real mensch uh you can go now take your nap uh <laughs> milk the cows whatever you do interrupted it very badly so. <laughs> okay so uh guys it's great seeing you here uh, today on youtube and we'll see you next week at the same time here on israel News Talk Radio. you get the inside news on Israel. At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips with scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. Howdy, this is Rita from League City, Texas, now living in Israel. And though my heart may have belonged to Texas, it now belongs to Israel and all the fantastic show hosts at Israel News Talk Radio. Hi, this is Michael Solomon from Kiryat Arba, Israel. And why do I love listening to Israel News Talk Radio? Because I love listening to the interesting interviews they do and their news reporting that most other media sources don't cover. Hey, this is Nicole Eko from Malmo, Sweden. It gets pretty cold here in Sweden, so I love cuddling up with a warm cup of tea while I listen to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, everybody, this is Frank Carr from Tennessee. Me and my dog Buster really love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. <laughs> You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.